here we are. My name is Phyllis Jackson. We are interviewing Julius Cole. We are in the Ray Charles Performing Arts Center on the campus of Morehouse College. Today is August 18th, 2016. Thank you, sir, for being with us today. We appreciate it. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, we're really excited about this. Tell me, take me back. Take me back to your youth, your younger days, your childhood, your background. When and where did you grow up? I was born right here in Atlanta, Georgia. In fact, I could see Morehouse College from my bedroom. That's how close I live to the college. I was born in uh, 1942 and received my early education here in Atlanta at E.R. Carter and Booker T. Washington High School. So I grew up in the, in the shadow of Morehouse College and uh, spent most of my early life here in Atlanta. Was it, you talk about that shadow, was it uh, something you aspired to accomplish? Was it something you thought about often, seeing the greatness of Morehouse that you wanted to attend? Well, it was not uh, too difficult uh, to look too far because Morehouse at that time had a reputation of being the best uh, college for men uh, in, the, in the United States, especially in the South. And growing up in a segregated community and going to all black schools at that time uh, and knowing my family's uh, financial situation, Morehouse College was the only college that I applied to. It's the only one that I, that I wanted to go to. My brother had gone to Morehouse before me and so I had a feel for what the college was like. I used to spend a lot of time on the campus with my brother. And so this was the institution for me that was the, the, the institution to go to. Wow. Talk to me about your parents, and you talked a little bit about the financial situation. Tell me about growing up in the home, a segregated uh, community, and what did your parents do for a living? Well, my parents were uh, from uh, the Atlanta area, especially my mother. She was born in Richmond, but grew up in Atlanta, in the Pittsburgh area of Atlanta. Uh, my father was a, a, a person who was born in Iowa, of a mixed heritage, uh, both European and African American, sort of a self-made man uh, who spent uh, most of his life uh, seeking out his own education. He was the first person in his family to graduate from high school and to go to college. And uh, went to uh, the University of Iowa, went to the University of Chicago uh, during the Depression, ran out of money, and, uh, worked as a Pullman porter on the railroads, and came to Atlanta and met my mother uh, who was a, a student uh, at that time at Spelman College. So uh, that's how they met uh, and produced a family. And my father used to teach at Booker T. Washington High School. My mother was a school teacher in the uh, uh, just, uh, northern part of Georgia uh, and eventually ended up teaching at the John Hope School here in Atlanta. So my father ended up uh, doing uh, the, the years of the Depression uh, being paid in script uh, as a school teacher, so he decided he would become a federal employee and went to work at the post office. So I have a typical uh, African-American background in terms of, uh, I guess you would say, black middle class. But it's pretty clear to see that uh, with, within that upbringing, uh, a higher education was a foregone conclusion, safe to say, for you. Was uh, it discussed a lot in the home? Oh, definitely. Uh, I used to say that uh, I went to the public schools here in Atlanta and had some great teachers. Uh, who were really interested in the development of their children. But I would say that uh, I went to public school in the daytime and I was in home school at night. That, that my mother would make sure that what I didn't learn in school, that I was gonna get at home. She was a fourth grade school teacher and education was her life and her belief. My father was also very strict in that regard. And uh, just to give you an example, my, my brother didn't even finish high school. He left high school at the age of 15 and came to Morehouse and graduated at the age of 19. So you get some idea of how well our parents and the school system prepared us uh, for, for our, our flight in life, if one can say that. That's amazing. Talk to me about the community surrounding you. Were you really aware of, did you feel what was happening during that time, that era for African Americans? Well, I grew up uh, basically in a neighborhood that became my neighborhood for most of my life. I was born uh, at Harris Memorial Hospital, which is right across the street from Washington High School. At that time, 
we had uh, two black hospitals and one public hospital in town. Grady Hospital was a public hospital. But my parents had enough resources that they didn't go to Grady, that I was born in a private African-American hospital. And then I lived about two blocks from that hospital, my first home. And then we moved to our grandparents' home in Pittsburgh, and I went to school there and stayed with my grandparents just to be able to save enough money so our parents could buy a home uh, where we eventually ended up in 1950 at a neighborhood called Fountain Drive. Fountain Drive was a very interesting area in those days. It was right behind Washington High School. And it was a community founded by Marsh Brown College because Marsh Brown College was supposed to be located in that area. But since Atlanta University gave the campus over to Marsh Brown, that they didn't need that uh, campus that they were going to set up in the um, Fountain Drive area. So they sold uh, those lots to their alums. And so my father, being an alum of Marsh Brown College, in terms of where he finally ended up graduating, uh, brought a piece of land and paid cash for a home that was built uh, in the 1950s. And Morehouse professors lived in that area. Uh, Pascal's original home of the Pascal's restaurant was in that area. Mm -hmm. And most of the people were school teachers and postal workers and uh, preachers or bishops or lawyers or those kinds of people. So it was a very lovely neighborhood. If I had to grow up in a in a purely black community, I grew up in one that was really a very idealistic community in terms of well-educated people mm -hmm. and business people living in that neighborhood. So they had a lot of, of people who became inspirational characters for me and uh, people that I could aspire to become. Great role models for oh, you. Well, wonderful role models. Wow. In and fact, I the speech professor of Martin Luther King lived across the street from me. And uh, he was a, a very well-known professor at Mohouse called Glaston Lewis Chandler. But uh, he was really a tough professor, but he gave Martin Luther King a C plus in speech. So that gives you some idea of how tough he was. Very tough. It, very, very tough. What do you call about some of the not so positive, maybe imagery or stories, uh, things that let you know about the world outside of this idealistic community you lived in? Well, it was still a, a black community, and I lived in a black world. Uh, I went to school, all black students, all black teachers. Uh, I was uh, segregated in terms of public facilities, in terms of black water fountains, black toilets, uh, back of the bus in terms of the busing system. Uh, my school received secondhand textbooks from Brown High School and Bass High School. Uh, so it was really a very segregated uh, community. Uh, very often we look back at Atlanta and say Atlanta had the theme of too busy to hate. But there was a lot of hate back in those days, especially between the black and the white community, and especially in the, the poorer white community in terms of animosity toward the black population. Uh, the community we lived in was not too far from West End, and West End was a white community in those days with a, 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 a public housing project. And so one experienced a lot of, of, of degradation in terms of how blacks were treated in those days, how they did, were disrespected, uh, how our parents were disrespected, being called girl and boy, and not having uh, facilities to be able to go to, uh, such as entertainment, the movies, and so forth. There was one black uh, movie house uh, on the west side. We could not go to movie houses downtown, uh, except for the Fox Theater, which had a black session. We call it the Buzzard's Roof. And so I remember all of those days, and the fact that my brother and I, even though we were college students, could only uh, do menial work. Uh, that was always the, the case with most people in the black community. We were short order cooks. We uh, clean bathrooms in the bathhouses of, of the country clubs. We picked crabgrass on golf courses and those kinds of things. We were paper boys. And those were the kind of jobs that we could get. So it was not a, an easy life, even though the community was a supporting community that I had no problems with. Hmm. It, did, it, did it ever for you become frustrating? And talk to me about if there was frustration, and I'm sure there was at some point. How did your parents talk to you about coping. What were the coping skills and strategies they gave you that you could employ to help you address what was happening? Well, at, the, at, at home in the family there was tremendous support. Uh, there was a tremendous push. Uh, my mother was the 
the, 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 the person who said, son, aspire to be the very best that you can be, and I will help you get there. And my father was the push. You have to work hard to get to where you want to be, and I'm going to make sure that I push you to get there. And so with that push and pull from my parents, I found it to be very supportive in terms of I knew the way to be successful was to get an education. And so I strive to do the very best that I could do in school and to get involved in all the activities I could get involved in, the science club, the French club, the science club, everything you can think of, uh, editor of the yearbook and all of those things, and uh, vice president of the student government at, at my high school, secretary of the student government, the vice president of the student government in college. So I was a very active student, and I was given a lot of ex exposure uh, from the Episcopal Church, the Canterbury Association, took me to conferences uh, when I was even in high school before I came to college so I could have the experience of uh, interacting with uh, other students and learning about the world. Yeah. Well, one of the interesting stories that really had an impact me was in the 10th grade. Uh, for the first time in my life, I went to the Atlanta Civic Auditorium and was invited to a performance of the a group called the... Uh, it was, called, it was a wonderful group, uh, it's a humanitarian group. And they put on a play, and this place talked about living together in a world uh, together as human beings, and people were from China, they were from India, they were from Russia, from all over the world. So at that point I said to myself, I wanna be a part of that world and not the racist world that I was living in. So in the 10th grade, I began to look at how I could become, as we say in French, a citoyen du monde, a citizen of the world. And so I wanted to make sure that I had that opportunity. And Morehouse gave me that opportunity. It sent me abroad twice. I went to Africa as a sophomore, paid for by my fellow students. Each one contributed a dollar to send me to Africa. And so I came back and told them about Africa and what that was like. So from that experience, I had a chance to interact with white students uh, for the first time in a really in a, a serious uh, sort of setting where we exchange uh, our lives and problems about our country with African students, and I felt that I could be competitive just as like they were. Even though there were Yale and Harvard and all these schools are in the group, a uh, boy from Morehouse held his own, so I felt very proud of myself, and I began to get more confidence in myself. And as you communicated with some of these uh, uh, kids from the majority community who were also attending Ivy League schools, what what was their thinking? Uh, did you talk about the civil rights movement? Did you talk about the plight of African Americans at the time? And, and if so, w did there appear to be sensitivity and concern about you know, African Americans at that time? Well, the first experience that I had going overseas was with, was with Crossroads Africa. There were eight white students in the group and two black students, one black female and myself. And then we worked with students from the Shikanta Diop University in Dakar and from the Bathurst High School in the Gambia. These students were very, very bright, all of them. And then we worked on a, a service project, building a one-room schoolhouse in a village in Africa. And in the evenings, we would talk about uh, various aspects of our own cultures and society. I was given the task to talk about the racial situation in the United States. The students, most of them who were white, came from New England and from, uh, I would say, very privileged backgrounds and had no idea of what it was like to be live in a racist society in the South. And they were reading books like Robert Penn Warren and all of these things, but that would not give them a true picture. And so some of them reacted very negatively to my presentation of what it was like living in a segregated community in the southern part of the United States. Uh, but it didn't deter me because the truth had to be the truth. And I think that I did gain a lot of respect uh, from the African students and from the other students uh, who were more open to what I had to say. And I think they gained uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, experience out of this from both of themselves in learning that the, our society was a very complex society that had a lot of problems that needed to be resolved and to hide those problems from the world community would not be the best way to communicate with people. Having that opportunity to go abroad like that and share with, with, uh, with others, that is a seed. You know, it's like uh, being able to just sow a seed of knowledge into them. But when you return, when you come back to Atlanta 
and the campus of Morehouse College. Talk to me about your experience there and how you feel it shaped you into who you are, what you would become when you graduated. I must say that Morehouse College uh, was the, really the pinnacle of my early life. It, it took me from Washington High School at the level that I was then, taught me the things that I might have missed in terms of that earlier training and gave me what I feel is one of the best educations that I could have received anywhere. It gave me an education about people and life in general. It gave me the theories that I needed to understand in terms of political and economic theory. But it also gave me the practical solutions in life and taught me leadership skills. It taught me streetwise skills. It taught me how to relate to people and it taught me some political skills because I was very active in student politics and very active in the student movement uh, up to a certain point. And those skills I learned at this institution. I'm always going to be grateful for what the Morehouse experience gave me. It provided me with the confidence that I could compete anywhere in the world, I could travel anywhere in the world on my own, and I could really cope with life, no matter where it was. Was it in Russia, was it in Finland, was it in North Africa? It didn't matter. Morehouse had prepared me. And listening to Dr. Mays uh, give us talks about how we had to prepare ourselves for that global competition always rested in my mind as something that here was a person that gave me the inspiration to go out and be successful in life, to compete at the highest level and to be ready for that competition. I also was very fortunate that Morehouse sent me abroad to study abroad for a year. Charles E. Merrill, who was a benefactor for Morehouse, in 1962 gave me and five other students $3,000 to leave the United States and see the world. We didn't have to study, we didn't have to do anything, we could go anywhere we wanted to do and have any experience that we wanted to have, but we had to leave the country for a year and come back and then talk about that experience with our fellow students. I can't even imagine, as a young man, what was that like for you? It was really a quite a opening and an experience that was really the crowning experience of my college career in the sense that it provided me with an opportunity to travel from Moscow to Lisbon, Portugal, from Finnish Lapland to North Africa and Greece, to see the world, to look at communism and its reality, to look at socialism, uh, to visit England, to visit Scotland, to visit France, to go to all the great art museums of the world. It was a period of growth and development and learning in terms of having an experience both academically and traveling to see the world and experiencing the world. I was only, uh, I guess at that point in my life, 20 years old. I mean, hitchhiking all over Europe uh, by myself uh, most of the time and just traveling where I wanted to go, doing what I wanted to go, being with whom I wanted to be, and learning about the world. I mean, it's just a wonderful experience. Did you feel a sense of freedom, a different kind of freedom internationally? For the first you? time in my life, I felt a free man. Even though Europe had its problems, I mean, you can't say that there were not racial attitudes in England and France and other countries that I visited. But for the first time in my life, I could go where I wanted to go, be with whom I wanted to be with, socialize with any friends that I wanted to be from around the world, and it gave me the confidence that I could not only compete in the American environment, I could compete in the global environment. That I was able to t study at the University of Geneva, I studied French and became quite fluent in the language. I also took a test and, and studied in the Faculty of Sciences Economiques et Sociales. So I studied uh, economics in French and international relations in French. And so I felt that I was in good shape. I mean, I came out of that, I was ready to conquer the world. Uh, toward the end of that period, when I was getting ready to come back to the United States, I was in Greece at the time that Martin Luther King gave his famous uh, speech uh, in a march on Washington at the Washington at the Lincoln Memorial and I was traveling along uh, in a car and listening to that speech and my reaction was one of anger 
it was like, you know, we've been dreaming too long. And I was just angry that, you know, that for the first time in my life that I had had this freedom and I was going to go back to my country. And the dream was there. And I look back at that speech now, it was one of the greatest speeches that was ever given. But at that time as a young man, I was angry uh, that I didn't want a dream, I wanted a reality. And that's how I felt. And uh, I often say that if I had not had my parents to push me, I probably would have stayed in Europe because I felt that uh, much at ease and free for the first time in my life. But it was the fact that my mother would have been hurt and my parents would have been crushed if I had not finished college in the United States. So I had to come back. And when you did, to the perhaps harsh reality of what was going on here, how did that impact you in terms of the civil, take me to the civil rights movement from your perspective. Um, how did what you saw here, uh, here at Morehouse, here around the world, how did this impact your desire and your willingness to get engaged? And if so, how did you get engaged in the civil rights fight? Well, I came to Morehouse in 1959, and then the student movement was just on the way at that time. Uh, I was very active in the Canterbury Association, uh, which is an Episcopal student organization, and a lot of the students who were involved in the civil rights movement uh, came to the Canterbury House. So there was a lot of discussion, a lot of involvement. I knew all the leaders of the Atlanta movement, uh, Lonnie King, Charles Black, uh, Julian Bond, all of these people I knew very well. I became very actively involved in student politics even my freshman year and was elected secretary of the student government. And so during my sophomore year, I was already in student government and a student leader here at Morehouse. My parents were very conservative in that sense that they were afraid of losing their jobs. That if I got arrested and became a high profile person in the civil rights movement and the student demonstrations at the time, both my father, who was a federal employee, and my mother, who was working for the Atlanta public school system, told me that I could do anything that I wanted to do in the movement, keep a low profile, and not get arrested. So I followed their advice because they were my parents and they had given me so much in life. But I participated very actively in the demonstrations uh, against riches, uh, participated against uh, the restaurant or the famous Lester Maddox restaurant with his axe handles. I was down uh, in the city of Atlanta at the time the Ku Klux Klan was walking on one side of the street and students were on the other side of the street with the Atlanta police in the middle to try to keep us apart. So I went through all of those demonstrations in the city of Atlanta. I participated in one of the first uh, demonstrations to integrate the Capitol uh, uh, in the gallery where we, people could go up, blacks were not allowed to go up in the gallery. So uh, a white professor here at Morehouse, Dr. Ovid Futch, took a group of us and we integrated the gallery in the, in the, uh, in the Capitol. So I participated in all those uh, demonstrations. I was also a driver, uh, driving demonstrators uh, back and forth. I had my parents' cars, so I would take the car and drive them to the different locations of wherever we wanted to demonstrate. So I, I found that to be a, a really a wonderful experience for me, even though there a lot of students were arrested and things happened. Uh, I, th I think that if I had been in another city, it might have been a lot more dangerous. But I felt comfortable in the student movement, and I felt that it was a movement that was justified and it was needed. And the only thing that I didn't do was go to jail. So well, that's that, pretty good. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I felt, uh, you know, sort of cheated by that regard because everybody else was going to jail and I wasn't. You wanted some street cred, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. A little bit of street cred. But talk to me about Dr. King, his impact on your life. Did you? Did you well, get to meet him and know him? Well, Dr. King was here in Atlanta. You know, he, he, I mean, even he had moved from Birmingham and he'd moved to Atlanta and I was here at that time as a student. Uh, I knew his uh, father and when the movement started and then King would interface with us from time to time in the movement and I would go and listen to him speak and what an inspirational spe speaker. The one who got a C plus at Morehouse in speaking I, I just I say, how could someone get a C plus with his eloquence and, and oration and, and just listening to the man talk and how he could me mesmerize an audience. Uh, I remember very well at Mount Moriah Baptist Church one time when the black leadership of Atlanta had been really uh, called out as being traitors uh, to the black community. And this was a, an evening where people were shouting Uncle Tom and all these kinds of things 
uh, to the black leadership in terms of negotiation of the desegregation of restaurants in Atlanta, things got somewhat out of hand and they called for Dr. King to come and they got him out of bed and he came to that church which is right up right around the corner from here and spoke to that audience and quieted them down in such a manner that I had never seen that before in my life for people who were almost ready to riot and King took them and mesmerized them and convinced them that what was being done was in their interest and that we should get behind and support the leadership in the community. And people gave him a standing ovation and walked out of that church satisfied and pleased. But that's the impact of a, of a Martin Luther King. And his leadership was a true leadership. I remember coming back from Africa in 1961, getting on a plane in New York, and he was on that plane. And I, to my surprise, I got on the plane walking back to the back uh, in the economy section. And who was there? Martin Luther King. I said, what are you doing back here? He said, this is where I ride. He was not in business class. He was not in first class. He was in economy. And that's the kind of simple life. And you look where he lived on, uh, over there in, uh, in the Vine City area. He wasn't ostentatious. He was simple. He was down to earth. He was approachable. He would talk to students and walking across the campus. And he was a professor of religion while I was a student here. Even though I was not in the class, I had ample opportunities to see him and to interact with him as a student. But a true leader, I mean, a really an outstanding person that we just loved and admired. And the fact that you would take the Benjamin Elijah Mays, who was president of the college, and then you take a Martin Luther King, you take those two, and you put them together, I mean, what an inspirational place to be at that time when all of this was going on. So we not only had the student movement, but we also had the anti-war movement, which I was also very actively involved in. So there was a lot to do. But one thing was always, in my case, that was most important, academics, keeping up with my classes, keeping up with my studies, because that was also important, that the student movement was important, but academic success and achievement in life was also going to be important. And so I, I stayed the course. I graduated on time. And then I applied to uh, all the graduate schools that I thought were the top schools in international affairs to continue uh, in the international uh, affairs area. And I got into all of them and uh, decided to go to, to Princeton, which gave me a full scholarship and a living stipend. So my parents didn't have to pay anything for my graduate education. So I felt that I participated in the movement but I also learned and developed myself to prepare myself to go to the best graduate schools in the country. Uh, and, I, and, and that paid off that way because that's where I ended up. And once you walked away, because this is just, we're only scratching the surface of the incredible things you've done. Just, I feel like we want to take four more hours to just talk to you because it's such rich information. But when you were done, what did you decide at that point to do with your life? And how did the, the things you experienced from childhood through the Morehouse years help guide that decision? Well, I go back uh, to my uh, college experience, uh, even though I, my desire to become an international citizen started in the 10th grade. It was Morehouse that gave me the opportunity to realize that dream in the sense of sending me abroad twice uh, to Africa and to Europe to study. That preparation was the best preparation that I could have had for a career in international development. So when I came out of college and graduate school, the only career that I wanted to pursue was a career in international development. And I wanted to help people to improve their quality of life by working for the United States Agency for International Development. And so that's where I applied to work. And lo and behold, I was given that opportunity. And uh, I started off in the Foreign Service at the bottom. Uh, and within 13 years, I had worked myself up to the top and moving from a junior officer trainee to assistant mission director in 13 years. And so I spent approximately 14 years of my life in the senior foreign service in very senior positions in the Agency of International Development. I had worked in Vietnam. I had worked in Morocco, Liberia. I had traveled and worked in Nepal and Swaziland and Senegal. So I had a wonderful career that I really felt that I had achieved all of my objectives that I had set out in, out in life. Uh, the only one that I didn't achieve was becoming uh, eventually as an ambassador, but that didn't happen. But in terms of career achievement and success, I rose to the highest rank in the Korea Foreign Service of Korea Minister. 
and there were very few African Americans who who rose to that level in the Foreign Service, and there were so few of us that I feel that I, that my preparation at Morehouse and Princeton really prepared me for life and for a successful career in international affairs. And when you look through your life and and you think about what's going on right now, and you think you, I've heard you say a number of times the preparation, mm -hmm. the preparation that it was more than just the academics, that it was preparing you for life. Fast forward to what's going on right now in terms of some of the same challenges we faced during the Civil Rights Movement are occurring right now. We've got cases of police brutality. We have a hotly contested presidential election that seems on one side to be bringing out the very worst of us in terms of uh, racism. How do you feel about what's happening today? And contrast for us the Civil Rights Movement then to the modern movement right now? When I look back at the civil rights movement, there was a, a clear objective of the desegregation of American society and to live up to this constitution of ours of liberty, equality, and justice for all. And I think that we really had that motivation uh, to, one, end segregation, and two, uh, to promote a more peaceful environment in the world. So we were anti-war also in terms of the war in Vietnam, even though I had to eventually end up serving there for two years. Uh, as a student, uh, I was very much of a pacifist and against the war and where it was going. When I look at the Black Lives Matter movement today, I think it, it has a lot of very positive ob objectives but I still think there's need for more clarity and definition of what the movement is trying to achieve. I think in terms of looking at all of the deaths that are being caused by police violence, all of the deaths that are resulting in people losing their lives are really, it's really unfortunate. And I think that that is one of the primary objectives to bring about a more equitable treatment of black males and black people in general by uh, the police and the policing authorities in our country. I think this is long overdue. In a way, one can say that it is a continuous movement because even in the earlier days, there were always things that police did against blacks. Um, as a child growing up in Atlanta, I always felt that the police were not necessarily on my side, that I had to be careful. My parents taught me to always be respectful to the police because if I wasn't, this could result in problems. So it was always, on one hand, saying that I need them, but on the other hand, a fear. And even to this day, I still have that fear because I never know what might happen in terms of somebody who may not be uh, uh, one who believes in equality and justice for all, stopping me and doing something to me just because I am a black man. And I think that that's still a fear today among a lot of uh, black people that racial injustice in the United States, while it has improved dramatically, is still a problem that has to be rectified. And I think the Black Lives Matter movement is, is one movement in that direction, but it's not the only one that's needed, I think, in terms of changing this racism that still exists in American society. You know, I certainly think that um, it would be unfair to say that there's any young person or emerging leader who could be compared to the likes of Martin Luther King. His, his service can't be touched. Do you see any leadership emerging outside of back, Black Lives Matter, perhaps, where you have a little confidence mm -hmm. that something may actually change? Well, I think when we lost Martin Luther King, we lost perhaps the greatest leader in the African-American community, not only in terms of history, but in terms of even looking toward the future. I mean, I, don't, I haven't seen anyone to really rise to that level of leadership and vision of where he saw the movement and where he wanted to take the movement. I've often thought and looked at some of our leaders that are there from the churches and from educational institutions and so forth. But perhaps we'll never have another modern. 
perhaps we will have many Martins, and hopefully we will have many Martins. That means that the black leadership of the future will be a, a bifurcated leadership. There will not be a single great leader or five people who, who emerge as great leaders of organizations. What we have to do now is to harness that leadership potential that is coming out of institutions like Morehouse, institutions like Howard and Spellman, to make sure that they have the moral grounding uh, to provide a leadership to develop the black community. So often I go back and I look at my own experience in different ethnic communities and I look at the Asian community and the Jewish community and the emphasis that these communities have given to the development of their future generations in terms of providing educational opportunities and emphasizing the need for the development of, the, of these educational institutions to prepare their people to live in American society and to be able to compete in American society. I think if we are to change this society that the family system and the educational system have to work together to develop a new black community that is strong, well-educated, and highly competitive to be able to compete in our society. What's considered black-on-black -black crime? How do we address the ills in our own community? Not that one justifies the other by any means, but how do we address the ills in our own community? Is education alone enough? No, it's not enough. Education is important in that regard. I think in terms of looking back at people who've been successful in American society, that education has been very important. But family structure has also been important. The role of the family, I look back at my own life and my brother and I, if we didn't have the mother and father that we had, would we have been as successful as we have been in our own careers? My brother, uh, who I say graduated at 19 from college, became a, a general surgeon at the age of maybe 25 or something like that. I mean, he's a phenomenal surgeon. But we were pushed, we were guided, uh, we were groomed, we were given moral values. And I think that the family structure in, in the uh, black community has to be strengthened. And it's either through the church or through reunions. But we have to work on that family structure to make sure that that family is there and that family is gainfully employed and providing the moral guidance that's needed for raising children in, that, in this society that we live in. So that family structure and education are both important. I think preparing themselves for employment opportunities to be able to have gainful employment and to be able to uh, to be able to earn a living in our society. I mean, these are things that worry me. There are so many people today from the black community that are unemployed. And how do we correct this problem? I'm not sure that the welfare system alone by itself is the only way to correct the problem. It is definitely something that is needed. But we also need to pull up our bootstraps and then to take care of our own. And the question of how do we do that by either creation of more black businesses, uh, creation of more uh, educational opportunities for our, our students, better preparation. There's a lot that has to go into that. And a lot of that is also this new leadership that we're talking about, making sure that they give that message out to the community. Perhaps uh, many of us were naive uh, to think that one person alone in this era uh, would have been able to address those ills and the excitement around change in the, the hope of a President Barack Obama. Talk to me about the first black president, what it meant to you, what it means now. I, I never thought in my life that I would live in my lifetime to see America to have a black president and to not only be a one, a one term president, but to win, win a second term and to be at the level of popularity that he is, well over 50%, which is unheard of. That is truly amazing. I look back and I see a young person who is very intelligent, very articulate, and an excellent role model for blacks and for Americans in general. His own experiences in life, his own background, I think prepared him 
for this role. I think that his administration uh, tried to achieve a lot. I think it was blocked by a very conservative and reactionary Congress that didn't allow him to really complete his agenda. But as a, as a first African-American president of the United States, I think he has done an outstanding job, even though there are blacks and whites who will criticize uh, what he has done and what he's tried to achieve. I think when history looks back at his record, they will say that he was an outstanding president. And he will go down in history as one of our greatest presidents. Could he possibly be able to please all? Could he possibly have addressed some of the challenges we face in the African American community? Was it his responsibility to do so? Well, I look back and say that we always have the expectation that our first black leader will bring about tremendous change, but change does not occur easily in American society, and it takes time. The fact that we were able, in a majority population that is basically European, elect a black president is an achievement within itself. And I think his performance says there is no doubt in the minds of the American public that a black man can be president. A black man can be vice president and hold major political responsibility in this country. And there are lots of achievements, and I think his health uh, program is going to be a, a really a, a program that's going to be one that's going to be celebrated because it's a, I think it's uh, the greatest uh, achievement in the health area uh, since the uh, Social Security system uh, and then they moving along with the, uh, the uh, Affordable Care Act. It just carries us to another level that I think it's, 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 it's going to be looked upon. I think he's trying to do a lot in terms of immigration, but he hasn't been able to achieve what he wanted to achieve. But looking back, I think he's going to be looked upon as a, as a great president and has achieved a lot. The criticism that people make is that he didn't do enough for African Americans. And I think if we look back in terms of job creation and his bringing this economy out of recession, I think the people will look back at that in a more positive manner that you can't just dictate employment you have to create the atmosphere to create the employment. And I think he has done that very successfully in terms of creating jobs because you just keep hearing reports of 200,000, 300,000 jobs being created and the economy is doing extremely well. Even though our new uh, candidate uh, Trump criticizes him about the economy, it's never been as best as it's been since even going back before the depression of 2008. So I feel good about it. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's a lot better than it was, I can assure you. You, you know, when you, when you mentioned being prepared and, and getting the education that you have, we're seeing right now, perhaps you can really elaborate on this for us, the drop in the desire for higher education amongst the group of African Americans, especially young black men. What, in your estimation, is going on there? And what are the differences between today's young African American male and the African American man of the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s? It's like going back to the old school in terms of looking back at the young black male of my generation coming up. We were live, living in an oppressed environment and this oppressed environment was a barrier to success. So we had something to fight against and we had something to struggle against. And we had our parents to inspire us that if we want to overcome the injustice in our American society, that we have to prepare ourselves and be ready to compete in this very competitive world that's called the United States and the, and the world in general. Sometimes I look back and I look at this young generation. I've been at Morehouse now for over 12 years. I think that some of these kids have had it too easy, that they haven't had those barriers that were visible, even though the barriers are still there, they're under the false delusion that you know, things have taken care of and no longer the problems of racial injustice in this society. But I think they're slowly learning that that's not the case, but it's a learning process. And they're learning. But sometimes I feel that the students who've been given the opportunity to go to college are not applying themselves as much as they should apply themselves in terms of preparing themselves to go on to graduate school and for professional jobs. 
Some of them just want to get by and just do enough to pass, just to get out, uh, to graduate from high school, uh, to get out of college. That's not enough. Uh, the challenges uh, for the black community are still out there, and we're going to have to tighten our bootstraps and really buckle down and do the best that we can, given those opportunities to, uh, for an education, to really apply ourselves uh, to the best possible, to be able to be competitive. Nobody's going to give you anything. You have to earn it. And that's one thing about American society. If you can prove that you can do it, you can make it in this society. And we've got to prove it still. Mm -hmm. I mean, not only in terms of myself feeling that I had to prove myself all along the way from going back to college all the way through my professional career, it's always proving myself that I could do the job. I would have hoped that my daughter, uh, and my, I have two daughters, that they wouldn't have had to face that challenge. But I saw them facing their challenge, even though they had a, a great educational opportunities. The challenge is still there. They're still facing challenges. They're still facing racial attitudes about what blacks can and cannot do. They still have to prove themselves, which I find amazing 50 years later, that that's still a problem out there. Mm -hmm. I, I remember seeing not too long ago um, the students of color at Harvard University put together um, a series of pictures to really talk about some of the challenges they faced being the only students of color at this incredible institution and some of the things that students um, said to them and how they reacted and listening to watching a picture of one with headphones assuming that he was listening to rap so his placard read I'm not listening to rap music <laughs> you know some some of these types of things you know the the, the strategy to overcome um, now means we have to employ something different. We must employ a different mindset. As moms and dads who saw our parents struggle, so they wanted to pave the way for us to have an easier life. Somehow in there, have we managed to spoil this generation who will come, as you say, into a college education and not apply themselves, not really fully understanding the weight and the, the shoulders they're standing upon in order to be here. Do you think that some of that is, is the case as well with our black students? Yes, I do. I mean, uh, I think that there are a lot of students who are applying themselves. I don't want to give the, the idea that students in this uh, day and age are not applying themselves. I've been at two African-American universities. I was at Howard University for three years, and I've been at Morehouse for about 12 years now. And I found the same problem at both institutions. I've also been on the advisory board at Princeton. And so uh, the, the, the efforts that are being made uh, for these students to improve their writing skills, I was shocked at Princeton that they have a, a remedial writing program. Uh, and, and that's definitely the case at Morehouse and at Howard. We have these programs to help our students to make up for deficits that they have. But I, I, I would say that Probably a half of the students are serious about their academic program, but another half sometimes are wasting their parents' money. They're not really applying themselves. And they're going to pay the price. Uh, there's no doubt. Once they get out in the work community and people find that they can't perform, uh, that's going to be a, a real a cast and aspersion upon their own abilities and their success in life. One of my uh, children did her undergraduate studies at Yale and did her graduate studies at Harvard. And that still, she had to prove herself. You know, they, black students at these institutions were looked upon as tokens, and they were looked upon as equal opportunity people in placement. In my own career, and going to Princeton in the 1960s, I was the only black student in my school, and only one of three in the whole graduate school. And so one of the first things that happened to me when I came to Princeton, and one student walked up to me and said, where did you go to school? I said, Morehouse College. He said, where is that? I said, Atlanta, Georgia. He said, how did you get here? I said, I got here just like you did. I worked my behind off. <laughs> and that's how I got here. <laughs> and so I, I found that to be kind of interesting, that 50 years ago that we were being challenged and looked upon as tokens and equal opportunity uh, people. And there might have been uh, some of that in terms of my getting into graduate school. But I proved myself that I could rise to the occasion. And I really applied myself, studying 10 to 12 hours a day uh, to get out and graduate on time. Out of 30 students in my class, in my department, 
28 of us graduated on time, and I was in the 28. And the ones that didn't graduate on time, one was from Princeton and the other one was from, from Yale. So I felt pretty good <laughs> that I made it out of there on time. Almost, it almost killed me, but I made it, and I felt pretty good about that. But 50 years or 60 years later, my daughter was facing the same type of discussion of white students walking up to say, how did you get here? You know, even with all of her achievement and, and everything that she had done, she was still looked upon as being an equal opportunity admittance to an Ivy League institution. Yeah, in the so, midst of, of the things that we've accomplished and we know we have, right. that, that that still exists. Does this now impact the way you talk to students when you see them, you know, about uh, around campus? And are you, are you able to instill something that gets them to wake up to this reality? Well, one of the reasons for my being here is I love to try to have an impact on students and to encourage them to become global citizens to expand their horizons and to offer them the opportunities that they can have the experience that I had of traveling and studying abroad. And so I am the director of the Andrew Young Center for Global Leadership at Morehouse, in charge of the study abroad program, and I really spent a lot of time encouraging them to study hard, to prepare themselves, not just to do the minimum to get by, but doing the best that they can do to learn the most out of what they're being taught to prepare themselves to live in this competitive environment that's not only American now, it's global. And that's what I really want to emphasize to them and to get, let them understand that nobody's going to give them something, that they have to earn it, and they're going to have to earn it by hard work and, and, then, and then preparing themselves to be very competitive and being the best that they can be. How serious is the competition out there today versus when you were a student? Is it a greater sense of competition now because you're, you now have kids of color competing with other minority populations for roles. We still don't have a, a serious placement in, in Simi Valley. We still aren't present uh, in greater numbers in some of these arenas. The numbers today are much larger than they were before, but it's still negligible in terms of, 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 of the American population. I never cease uh, to do my own assessment when I travel around the country and to travel to various businesses and corporations. I do, my, so I do a census of how many black people are out there in professional business, still very few. We still have a lot of work cut out for us to really become in the mainstream of this society in terms of getting into professional positions. We've come a long way, but the battle is still out there. We haven't accomplished everything we, we want to accomplish in that regard. And we still have to prepare ourselves and just work hard and still to become competitive to get those jobs. It's interesting to see that some students coming out of our institutions who have done the minimum have almost embarrassed the college in a way of not performing up to the level that they should be able to perform. And some of them lose those jobs and not become competitive. Some of them uh, are not able to, to stand the test of, of the graduate schools that they admitted to. Unfortunately, some of them have to uh, get out of those programs. But I must say that here at Mulhouse, those who have been admitted to the great schools and the great professional schools have generally done very well. And that's the encouraging side. But I want more numbers, not just a few. I want those numbers to be much greater, especially coming out of this institution. There's no reason why they can't be greater. Was there a sense when you were growing up you know, we hear that beautiful uh, proverb that it takes a village to raise a child. Obviously, from the incredible childhood you had and just being exposed to such a great number of great role models, is that sense still here? And have we eroded? You know, has there been some erosion of that mindset? Well, I think that's a, a very good quote. It takes a village to raise a child. And I define the, 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 the village as being the community. I define it as the starting with the family, then the community, and then the city and the state and the country that you're raised in. So that's a, that's a whole community that's much larger than a village in terms of being small. But it's all of that that's involved in raising that child to be the person that you want it to be. And it's, it's the values of the society. It's the the leadership models and roles that that person is exposed to, and then how that person is allowed to progress at each level in society. 
until the very end of his life. And so I, I still believe that very strongly, that that is the case. It takes a village to raise a child, but the village being defined as a much larger community than a village that we would think of being a small village. And the family is very important in that role. And that's what I think is something that we really got to work on, the family structure and values in, in our own society. What do you think your legacy will be? Or what do you want your legacy to be? So my legacy, I would look back in my life and say that I have helped others to achieve their goals and to improve their quality of life. And this is especially in regard to my own career of working overseas and working extensively in Africa in terms of helping the people to improve their overall quality of life. And has it been one of joy for you? I've had a wonderful life. It's been a great life. I couldn't have asked for more. Uh, it hasn't always been pleasant. It hasn't always been easy. But through the preparation and guidance that I've gotten from my family and the educational institutions that I have studied at, I said they prepared me for that struggle. They prepared me for that, that, that life that I wanted to leave and for the career that I've had in my life. So I can ask for nothing more. I've often said that uh, on the day that I do go to the happy hunting ground, as my grandfather used to call it, that you put on my tombstone that this man has lived a wonderful life and enjoyed himself to the fullest. And we have enjoyed you to the fullest. And we thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Pleasure's been ours.